Hi, this is Mike Curley from the C Team. We're doing another video today on the Dresden Files RPG in the Fate system, and today we're going to talk about skills and how to build your character. So the first thing about skills is they kind of operate on a uh, five to six point scale, or at least from zero to five for most characters. Anything above five is usually out of the realm of at least a starter character. Now the thing to remember is that there is no penalties. If you don't have a skill on your sheet, it's just listed as zero rather than negative one or negative two. So the system goes like this. Zero is mediocre. That means in a given skill, you have no real talent or training. So if we're going to go with say fencing as an example, a zero mediocre fencer means, you know, you, you know which end of the sword to pick up and that's about it. One is considered an average, and that's where you have a bit of training, or you have a pretty good talent, but no formal training. So maybe, going with the fencer again, you've attended a few classes, you've learned some stances, or you are one of those people that you get to the class, you pick it up, and you're, you know more or less what to do from there. Two is considered fair, and that is where you start getting into the highly trained, near professional level. I mean, you're not going to the Olympics yet, but you're winning a few matches. Or, on the other side of it, you have a little training, but a very, very good talent. Three is good, and that is like professional instructor level, where, you know, now you're winning tournaments. This is a thing where most of the people you meet, you can beat with the sword. Four is considered great, which is kind of your expert slash veteran level. It's a mix of a very high talent and training. That's where you're starting to get national attention. Maybe you are like a champion college level fencer. Now five is superb. That is master level, Olympic level ability. You have a very high talent and thorough training. This is where you're on the world stage. You are one of the top like 10 to 20 to 30 people in this skill. One of the best fencers ever. Now, six is considered fantastic, and for the most part, player characters can't get to that level, at least not right away. Six is, you know, you're an Avenger or something if you're six. If you have a six in a skill, you're squaring up with Captain America and giving him at least an even fight. Now, the way skills work in Dresden is there isn't like six attributes that you assign to skills or anything like that. Each one of the 25 skills has its own individual rating that you assign points to. You get a limited number of points, but the key here is you have to stack them. That means if you want a skill at five, you need at least one skill at four, three, two, and one. You can't put like five skills at five and four at four. It has to be the other way around, which usually means your character will have one, maybe two apex skills, two or three good skills, and a few that are around two and one level as kind of a foundation. The best way I find is to visualize it. I usually use spreadsheets. Today, I'm going to just demonstrate with some little tokens made by my soon-to-be uh, sister-in-law. Now, there's a few methods of stacking. For all of these examples, we're going to go with a submerged level character, which means they have 35 skill points and a cap of 5. So my favorite method is the pyramid method, which is where, as you can see, you have 1 at 5, 2 at 4, 3 at 3, 4 at 2, and 5 at 1. This gives you one Apex skill, although it can be hard to upgrade. As you can see, you need two points to upgrade anything. And that gives you, at 35 points, about 15 skills. Again, this is kind of the most basic way to look at it, and it's really good for a beginning player. Now, another way to look at it is through the towers. That way, you have two basic towers of skills, so you have two Apex, that's two at five. You have slightly fewer overall, with 14 total skills. And while it's easier to upgrade, you really can only upgrade your lowest one, since there's nothing to support a three right now, except for the two that's already there. So it might, you're going to be kind of stuck with those for a while. And there's any variations on that you can do. You could top out at four, or you can go with this one, what I try to call the jack of all trades, where you top out at three, so you don't really have any apex skills, but you have several at three, and far more overall. This one ends up with 19 total skills listed on your sheet. And that's out of 25, so you have a base of everything. You're not super great at anything, which you can augment with stunts and powers, which we'll get into in a later video, but you at least have your hand in for almost every skill you're gonna need. Okay, so now let's look at the skills themselves. 
I put them into five rough categories. The game doesn't do this, I just kind of do it because it's easier for me to categorize them. And those categories are physical, mental, social, information gathering, and utility. And each skill is going to have several trappings which are, within the skill, rough guidelines for what they're used for. So the first one we're going to look at is alertness, which as you can probably guess, the first trapping is avoiding surprise. You'll roll from this to avoid an ambush, for instance, or a trap, anything like that that doesn't depend on you specifically looking, but just realizing something's there. Now it's also used for combat initiative. So if you have a 2 in alertness, you're going to go ahead of somebody who has a 1. And finally, it's also passive awareness. This is just noticing things in the background, noticing things going on, spotting a clue when you're not looking for it, hearing someone from the next room over, any kind of not quite investigation role, but just passively finding things before they find you. And again, yeah, that one kind of fits into information gathering, but again, it's passive, so it's more in physical. Next skill is athletics, and it's not really worth getting into the individual trappings because they're all basically any kind of movement. Climbing, falling, jumping, sprinting, anything that has to do with movement that isn't specifically strength-based is in athletics, and that includes dodging. Athletics is your overall dodging skill, provided you're not able to use either fists or weapons, which we'll get to in a bit. But generally, if you're ducking for cover, if you're avoiding a big shot, athletics is what you're going to go with. So that's a good one to have high if you're expecting to have a physical character. Next is endurance, which is another one that's just kind of passive, but specifically physical. The first main thing it does is it governs long-term action. You're not going to be rolling endurance a whole lot. But if, for example, your campaign takes you on a long trek through the desert, you might roll endurance to see how well you got through it, whether you took any stress or injuries on the way, or if you're in combat for a long time, maybe the GM will go, oh, okay, roll for endurance. Oh, that was a bad roll. You have fatigue now. It's kind of just how long you can do things. Now, the other thing it does is it determines your physical stress track, which we'll get into in another video, but for now, it basically means how much punishment you can take in a fight. Okay, and now we're getting to the good stuff. The next one is fists, which, as you can guess, is just put them up, punching, any kind of martial art that it doesn't involve a weapon. So you can use it for attacks and for defense in melee specifically, if you can justify it. So you couldn't usually use fists to defend against like a thrown weapon or a gun. But if you're dodging a punch, you can use fists. Next one is guns, which is a little more nuanced than you might expect. So, obviously, shooting. But also, knowledge of guns. So, if you are playing something like a, a, a vigilante that uses a lot of guns, you can use guns as the skill to also maintain them or build them. You can also use it for aiming, which is specifically putting an aspect on somebody that you can tag for a later uh, attack. And also, basically, any other projectile weapons that isn't specifically thrown. So, crossbows, bows and arrows, rocket launchers. If there's a trigger or if it fires a projectile, you're using the gun skill to use it. Now, the next one is might. And like I said before, athletics is for everything movement-based. Might is for lifting things, breaking things, exerting force, and wrestling or grappling. Whereas in other systems, maybe athletics or strength might be used for grappling, like in D&D, this is specifically a might skill. Now we're going to get into the combat applications and how all that works in another video, but might is what you want if you need to break things, lift things, or wrestle with people. Now the last one in physical is weapons, and that's specifically melee combat. So we're talking swords, axes, maces, uh, tables, chairs, anything that you pick up and you swing at somebody is in weapons. And that includes thrown weapons. So if you're throwing a knife, throwing a bottle, throwing a sword, even throwing grenades and modern weapons, it falls under weapons. And like with fists, you can also use it for defense. So if you're in a sword fight, you can defend with weapons. And also like with guns, it's weapon knowledge. So if you're playing a samurai, you can use the weapon skill to maintain your weapon, or even to make declarations about others' weapons. 
So you could declare, oh, I recognize that sword, I know what style he's going to use. Now, the next category is mental, and there's only two here, because it's... Well, there are a lot of reasons you would use mental skills, but those have to do with mainly wizardry and a lot of the powers. Now, the first skill under mental is conviction. There's only two trappings here, and the first is acts of faith. So we're talking prayer, any kind of entreaty to a higher power, or faith in, in other contexts as well. It's kind of how you are inside, and it has a lot to do with the holy powers, which we'll get to in another video. The other major use of it, like endurance, it governs the mental stress track, which has a lot to do with spell casting, and we're going to get into it more in that video, but it's kind of how much mental damage you can take before you start taking real consequences. Now, the second skill under mental is discipline, which governs concentration. So if you are being distracted by something, it's how well you can keep going at task. It's also how well you control your emotions. So it's something you might roll to defend against getting angry or getting depressed or something like that. And it's also your mental defense. A lot of the powers have some kind of mental component, especially, say, your white court vampires or even red court vampires and their venom. So discipline is what you would roll to defend against attacks like that and basically anything else that might rattle you mentally. Now the next category is social. And this governs kind of the person-to-person -person interaction that doesn't involve taking a swing at each other. The first skill is deceit, and as you can guess, that's any time you're trying to, well, deceive somebody. Whether that's creating a distraction, uh, putting on disguise, giving somebody false information, or, you know, trying to uh, ferret information out of somebody else. It's any kind of deceptive interaction with somebody where you're trying not to go with the truth. Now, the next skill, and kind of the exact opposite of that, is empathy. And that's reading people getting a sense of who they are and what they're thinking. But it's also you can use actively to help console characters. So you might use empathy to help them heal a mental consequence or otherwise give them a an aspect they can tag that, you know, they've got a friend in you, that kind of thing. It's also generally your social defense. So there is social combat in the game. And this is what you would use to defend against somebody trying to deceive you or somebody trying to build rapport that you might not want. And it also do does double duty as your initiative in social contexts. The next skill under social is intimidation. And this is where you're trying to, well, intimidate people. You're trying to brush them off or interrogate them or provoke them. You can make social attacks with this. You can threaten to put an aspect on somebody. This is the bad cop skill. And next is performance, which I almost put in utility, but it's kind of got more use in the social context. It governs things like composition, whether that's writing something, making a painting, or playing an instrument, or singing, anything that's performative, or acting, something like that. But it's also art appreciation. So you could have somebody who's just a critic that has a high performance because they know what they're looking for. It's also for creative communication, where if you want to give somebody a signal through a performance or playing to an audience, it's, it's basically anything you're doing that can be flamboyantly acted out. Next under social is presence. And that's kind of a passive charisma, how your reputation is, how good you are at commanding people, and also it governs the length of your social stress track. Finally, under social, there's rapport. And that is being friendly, generally. This might, you might think of it as persuasion from D&D. It's chit-chatting, chit but it's also closing down. You can put on a friendly face without giving information using this. It's how you create a first impression. You roll rapport to say, oh, I want to get on this guy's good side. It's also another way to do social defense. Say, if somebody's threatening you, you try to be friendly with them to deflect that. It's basically any kind of friendly, cordial social interaction goes with rapport. Next category is information gathering. As you might know if you're a fan of the series, Dresden is a detective, and there are a lot of ways in the system to gather information of one sort or another. First one is contacts. This is knowing people. This is making the calls, talking to people on the street, getting tip-offs from people you know, knowing the rumors in town. That's what you would roll contacts for. And higher contacts get you better information and also better assistance. You might roll contacts to get an NPC on your side who maybe is an expert in something. 
The next is investigation, and this is straightforward. This is examining things, looking for clues, surveillance, eavesdropping, any kind of deliberate looking for clues. This is where you're shining a flashlight in the corner, you're going through someone's drawers, you're looking for footprints, anything that is like active. So this is something you do as an action rather than passive like alertness was. And then there's lore, which I almost put into mental because it has a lot to do with spell casting, but for our purposes, it fits more in information gathering. So lore is what you would use for arcane research, where you would be in some wizard's library looking for spell components, something like that. It's also the skill you use to perform common rituals, you know, your usual draw a circle, prick your finger, and do some minor effect that anybody can do. It also kind of works as alertness, but for mystical, mystical things. You know, the cold feeling on the back of your neck when a ghost walks through, that would be a lore roll. Sensing, oh, that thing has magic in it, that would be a lore roll. Basically, if it has to do with magic, you, could sub you can usually substitute lore for either investigation or alertness. And finally, there's scholarship, which is kind of a big one because it covers a lot. It's a lot of general knowledge, but it's also how to use a computer, uh, declaring minor details that are just simply knowledge factual. It's also something that the GM can use for exposition and knowledge dumping, where he kind of takes control of your character and says, okay, you rolled a five on this, I'm just going to read out what information you're giving to the party. Now, scholarship also governs how many languages you know, as well as your ability to give medical attention, so a doctor would have high scholarship. And it's also mundane research and lab work. Remember what I said about lore, how that's going through a wizard's workshop? This would be where you're doing tests, you're doing medical things or engineering, anything like that that would be a mundane research or lab work. And finally, the utility category, which I admit is kind of, I couldn't fit these skills anywhere else. But it's mostly stuff that has some kind of practical use in game that isn't specifically combat or magic oriented. Well, the first one is, of course, burglary, which is getting into places you're not supposed to be, uh, pickpocketing, lockpicking, infiltrating someplace, or casing a building, kind of the dirtier side of getting into places. The next is craftsmanship, which is pretty straightforward again. It's breaking things, building things, and fixing things. If you can do it with a wrench, it's probably craftsmanship. That includes car maintenance, home maintenance, building machines, anything, anything that you would do in you know, your backyard workshop. And next is driving, which is, I'll be frank, usually a dump stat. There isn't a lot of practical use within game because you know, you're not always in a car. And the knowledge is usually, in my games, has been hand-waved as just, okay, you live in this place, you don't need it. But generally speaking, driving is, you know, it's driving. It's chases, it's your ability to do other things while you're driving, so it might modify a gun's roll if you got a hand on the wheel and a hand on the gun. It also, you know, not just cars, but other vehicles like boats and planes, etc. And probably the most useful thing is, again, street knowledge and navigation where you're not even in a car, but you know how to get places. The next one is resources, and this is broadly how rich your character is. This might come into play if you need to buy something suddenly during a game that's normally outside of your kit. So you might roll to say, oh, how much cash do I have on hand? Or how much cash can I get right away? It also governs passively the quality of your equipment and your lifestyle. So someone with a three in resources would have a nicer apartment and nicer swords or guns or whatever than someone with a one or a two. And it also can be used in social context if, you know, you bribe somebody. It's an alternative to threatening or intimidating or even getting rapport where it's just like, okay, my character has a four in resources. I'm just going to slip this guy a hundred bucks to not bother us. All right. And the next skill under utility is stealth, which is where you set up the ambushes that you were previously defending with alertness. It's also just generally hiding or even following somebody without being seen, shadowing them, and just generally getting, a lot, getting around without being seen or heard is usually a stealth roll. And last is survival, which is, again, kind of a dump stat, especially if you're in a city-based game, because it's all based on wilderness and the wild. This would be animal handling, riding animals, scavenging for food, tracking, camouflage, 
Basically, anything that has to do with the woods is under survival. So again, think carefully before you grab that, especially if it's hidden, especially if it's a city game. Okay, so now you have a good rundown of the skills and how to build them. We're going to go a little more depth in character creation in a later video, but you could start kind of with this knowledge on how to build the basic skills for a character. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe, watch the other videos, and I'll see you next time.